Lucan's Pharsalia, translated by Sir Edward Ridley. Book Six, Part Two. These sinful rites and these her sister's songs abhorred Eric, though fiercest of the race, spurned for their piety, and yet viler art practiced in novel form. To her, no home beneath a sheltering roof, her direful head, thus to lay down, were crime. Deserted tombs, her dwelling place, from which darling of hell she dragged the dead, nor life nor gods forbade. But that she knew the secret homes of Styx, and learned to hear the whispered voice of ghosts at dread mysterious meetings. Never sun shed his pure light upon that haggard cheek. Pale with the pallor of the shades, nor looked upon those locks unkempt that crowned her brow. In starless nights of tempest crept the hag out from her tomb to seize the leaven bolt. Treading the harvest with a cursed foot, she burned the fruitful growth, and with her breath poisoned the air else pure. No prayer she breathed, nor supplication to the gods for help, nor knew the pulse of in entrails as do men who worship. Funeral pyres she loves delight, and snatched the incense from the flaming tomb. The gods at her first utterance grant her prayer for things unlawful, lest they hear again its fearful accents. Men whose limbs were quick with vital power she thrust within the grave. Despite the fates who owed them years to come, the funeral reverse brought from the tomb those who were dead no longer, and the pyre yields to her shameless clutch still smoking dust and bones enkindled, and the torch which held some grieving sire, but now, with fragments mixed in sable smoke and ceremental cloths, singed with the redolent fire that burned the dead. But those who lie within a stony cell, untouched by fire, whose dried and mummied frames no longer know corruption, limb by limb, venting her rage, she tears the bloodless eyes, drags from their cavities, and mauls the nail upon the withered hand. She gnaws the noose by which some wretch has died, and from the tree drags down a pendant corpse, its members torn asunder to the winds. Forth from the palms wrenches the iron, and from the unbending bond hangs by her teeth, and with her hands collects the slimy gore which drips upon the limbs. Where lay a corpse upon the naked earth, on ravening birds and beasts of prey, the hag kept watch, nor marred by knife or hand her spoil, till on his victim sees some nightly wolf. Then dragged the morsel from his thirsty fangs, nor fears she murder if her rights demand blood from the living or some banquet fell requires the panting entrail. Pregnant wombs yield to her knife the infant to be placed on flaming altars, and whene'er she needs some fierce undaunted ghost, he fails not her, who has all deaths in use. Her hand has chased from smiling cheeks the rosy bloom of life, and with sinister hand from dying youth has shorn the fatal lock, and holding oft in foul embraces some departed friend, severed the head, and through the ghastly lips held by her own apart some impious tale, dark with mysterious horror hath conveyed down to the Stygian shades. When rumor brought her name to Sextus in the depth of night, while Titan's chariot beneath our earth wheeled on his middle course, he took his way through fields deserted, while a faithful band, his wanted ministers in deeds of guilt, seeking the hag mid broken sepulchres, beheld her seated on the crags afar, where Hamus falls towards Pharsalia's plain. There was she proving for her gods and priests. Words still unknown and framing numbered chants of dire and novel purpose, for she feared lest Mars might stray into another world and spare the Salian soil the blood ere long to flow in torrents, and she thus forbade Philippi's field polluted with her song, thick with her poisonous distilments sown, to let the war pass by. 
such deaths she hopes soon shall be hers the blood of all the world shed for her use to her it shall be given to sever from their trunks the heads of kings plunder the ashes of the noble dead italia's bravest and in triumph add the mightiest warriors to her host of shades and now what spoils from magnus tombless course her hand may snatch on which of caesar's limbs she soon may pounce she makes her foul forecast and eager gloats to whom the coward son of magnus thus Thou greatest ornament of Haman's daughters, in whose power it lies, or to reveal the fates, or from its course to turn the future, be it mine to know, by thy sure utterance, to what final end fortune now guides the issue. Not the least of all the Roman host on yonder plain am I, but Magnus, most illustrious son, lord of the world, or heir to death and doom. The unknown affrights me. I can firmly face the certain terror. Bid my destiny yield to thy power the dark and hidden end, and let me fall for knowing. From the gods extort the truth, or if thou spare the gods, force it from hell itself. Fling back the gates that bar the Elysian fields. Let death confess whom from our ranks he seeks. No humble task I bring, but worthy of a Richtho's skill, of such a struggle fought for such a prize, to search and tell the issue. Then the witch, pleased that her impious fame was noised abroad, thus made her answer, If some lesser fates thy wish had been to change, against their wish it had been easy to compel the gods to its accomplishment, my art has power when of one man the constellations press the speedy death to compass a delay and mine it is though every star decrees a ripe old age by mystic herbs to shear than the life midway but should some purpose set from the beginning of the universe and all the laboring fortunes of mankind be brought in question then the salient art bows to the power supreme. But if thou be content to know the issue preordained, that shall be swiftly thine. For earth and air and sea and space and Rhodopean crags shall speak the future. Yet it easiest seems, where death in these Thessalian fields abounds, to raise a single corpse. From dead men's lips, scarce cold, in fuller accents falls the voice. Not from some mummied flame in accents shrill, uncertain to the ear. Thus spake the hag, and through redoubled night a squalid veil, swathing her pallid features, stole among unburied carcasses. Fast fled the wolves. The carrion birds with maw unsatisfied released their talons, as with creeping step she sought her profit. Firm must be the flesh as yet, though cold in death, and firm the lungs untouched by wound. Now in the balance hung the fates of slain unnumbered. Had she striven armies to raise and ordered back to life whole ranks of warriors, the laws had failed of Erebus, and summoned up from Styx, its ghostly tenants had obeyed her call, and rising fought once more. At length the witch picks out her victim, with pierced throat agape, fit for her purpose. Gripped by pitiless hook, o'er rock she drags him to the mountain cave, accursed by her fell rites, that shall restore the dead man's life. Close to the hidden brink, the land that girds the precipice of hell, sinks towards the depths. With ever falling leaves, a wood o'er shadows, and a spreading yew cast shade impenetrable. Foul decay fills all the space, and in the deep recess, darkness unbroken, save by chanted spells, reigns ever. Not where gape the misty jaws of cavern tainerous, the gloomy bound of either world, through which the neither kings permit the passage of the dead to earth, 
so poisonous, mephitic, hangs the air. Nay, though the witch had power to call the shades forth from the depths, twas doubtful if the cave were not a part of hell. Discordant hues flamed on her garb as by a fury worn. Bare was her visage, and upon her brow dread vipers hissed beneath her streaming locks in sable coils entwined. But when she saw the youth's companions trembling, and himself with eyes cast down, with visage as of death, thus spake the witch. Forbid your craven souls these fears to cherish. Soon returning life this frame shall quicken, and in tones which reach even the timorous ear shall speak the man. If I have power the Stygian lakes to show, the bank that sounds with fire, the fury band, and giants lettered, and the hound that shakes bristling with heads of snakes his triple head, what fear is this that cringes at the sight of timid, shivering shades? Then to her prayer. First, through his gaping bosom, blood she pours, still fervent, washing from his wounds the gore. Then copious poisons from the moon distills, mixed with all monstrous things which nature's pangs bring to untimely birth. The froth from dogs, stricken with madness, foaming at the stream. A lynx's entrails, and the knot that grows upon the fell hyena, flesh of stags, fed upon serpents, and the sucking fish which holds the vessel back, though eastern winds make bend the canvas, dragon's eyes, and stones that sound beneath the brooding eagle's wings. Nor Araby's viper, nor the ocean snake, who in the Red Sea waters guards the shell, are wanting, nor the slough on Libyan sands by horned reptile cast, nor ashes fail, snatched from an altar where the phoenix died. And viler poisons, many, which herself has made, she adds, whereto no name is given. Pestiferous leaves pregnant with magic chants, and blades of grass which in their primal growth her cursed mouth had slimed. Last came her voice, more potent than all herbs, to charm the gods who rule in lethe. Dissonant murmurs first, and sounds discordant from the tongues of men she utters, scarce articulate. The bay of wolves, and barking as of dogs, were mixed with that fell chant, the screech of nightly owl, raising her hoarse complaint, the howl of beast, and sibilant hiss of snake. All these were there. And more, the waft of waters on the rock, the sound of forests, and the thunder peal. Such was her voice. But soon in clearer tones, reaching to Tartarus, she raised her song. Ye awful goddesses, avenging power of hell upon the damned, and chaos huge, who strives to mix innumerable worlds, and Pluto, king of earth, whose weary soul grieves at his godhead, sticks, and plains of bliss we may not enter. And thou, Proserpine, hating thy mother and the skies above, my patron goddess, last and lowest form of Hecate, through whom the shades and I hold silent converse, warder of the gate who casteth human offal to the dog, ye sisters who shall spin the threads again, and thou, O boatman of the burning wave, now wearied of the shades from hell, to me returning. Hear me, if with voice I cry, abhorred, polluted, if the flesh of man hath ne'er been absent from my proffered song, flesh washed with brain still quivering, if the child whose severed head I placed upon the dish but for this hand had lived, a listening ear lend to my supplication. From the caves, hid in the innermost recess of hell, I claim no soul long banished from the light, for one but now departed, lingering still upon the brink of Orcus, is my prayer. Grant, 
for ye may, that listening to the spell once more he seek his dust, and let the shade of this our soldier perished, if the war, well at your hands, has merited, proclaim the destiny of Magnus to his son. Such prayers she uttered. Then her foaming lips and head uplifting present saw the ghost. Hard by he stood, beside the hated corpse, his ancient prison, and loath to enter in. There was the yawning chest where fell the blow that was his death, and yet the gift supreme of death, his right, ah, wretch, was reft away. Angered at death, the witch, and at the pause, conceded by the fates, with living snake, scourges the moveless course. And on the dead she barks through fissures, gaping to her song, breaking the silence of their gloomy home. Tisiphone, Megara, heed ye not? Flies not this wretched soul before your whips, the void of Erebus? By your very name, she-dogs of hell, I'll call you to the day, not to return. Those through sepulchres and death your jailer. From funereal urns and tombs I'll chase you forth. And thou too, Hecate, who to the gods in comely shape and mien, not that of Erebus, appearst, henceforth wasted and pallid as thou art in hell, at my command shalt come. I'll noise abroad the banquet that beneath the solid earth holds thee, thou maid of Enna. By what bond thou lovest night's king, by what mysterious stain infected, so that Ceres fears from hell to call her daughter. And for thee, base king, Titan shall pierce thy caverns with his rays, and sudden day shall smite thee. Do ye hear? Or shall I summon to mine aid that god at whose dread name earth trembles, who can look unflinching on the gorgon's head and drive the furies with his scourge, who holds the depths ye cannot fathom, and above whose haunts ye dwelt supernal, who by waves of sticks forswears himself unpunished? Then the blood grew warm and liquid, and with softening touch cherished the stiffened wounds and filled the veins, till throbbed once more the slow returning pulse, and every fibre trembled, as with death life was commingled. Then, not limb by limb, with toil and strain, but rising at a bound, leapt from the earth erect the living man. Fierce glared his eyes uncovered, and the life was dim, and still upon his face remained the pallid hues of hardly parted death. Amazement seized upon him, to the earth brought back again, but from his lips tight drawn, no murmur issued. He had power alone when questioned to reply. Speak, quoth the hag, as I shall bid thee. Great shall be thy gain if but thou answerest truly, freed for I from all Hamonian art. Such burial place shall now be thine, and on thy funeral pyre such fatal wood shall burn, such chant shall sound, that to thy ghost no more or magic song or spell shall reach, and thy Lethean sleep shall never more be broken in a death from me received anew. For such reward, think not this second life enforced in vain. Obscure may be the answers of the gods, by priestess spoken at the holy shrine. But who braves the oracles of death in search of truth, should gain a sure response. Then speak, I pray thee, let the hidden fates tell through thy voice the mysteries to come. Thus spake she, and her words by mystic force gave him his answer. But with gloomy mien, and tears swift flowing, thus he made reply. Cold from the margin of the silent stream, I saw no fateful sisters spin the threads. Yet know I this, 
that mid the Roman shades reigns fiercest discord, and this impious war destroys the peace that ruled the fields of death. Elysian meads and deeps of Tartarus in paths diverse the Roman chieftains leave, and thus disclose the fates. The blissful ghosts bear visages of sorrow, Sire and son, the Decii, who gave themselves to death in expiation of their country's doom, and great Camillus, wept, and Sala's shade complained of fortune. Scipio bewailed the scion of his race about to fall in sands of Libya. Cato, greatest foe to Carthage, grieves for that indignant soul which shall disdain to serve. Brutus alone, in all the happy ranks I smiling saw, first consul, when the kings were thrust from Rome. The chains were fallen from boastful Catiline. Him, too, I saw rejoicing, and the pair of Marii, and Cethegus's naked arm. The Drusi, heroes of the people, joyed in laws immoderate, and the famous pair of greatly daring brothers. Guilty bands, by bars eternal, shut within the doors that close the prison of hell, applaud the fates, claiming the plains elision. And the king throws wide his pallid halls, makes hard the points of craggy rocks, and forges iron chains, the victor's punishment. But take with thee this comfort, youth, that there a calm abode and peaceful waits thy father and his house. Nor let the glory of a little span disturb thy boding heart. The hour shall come when all the chiefs shall meet. Shrink not from death, but glowing in the greatness of your souls, e'en from your humble sepulchres descend, and tread beneath your feet, in pride of place, the wandering phantoms of the gods of Rome. Which of the chiefs by Tiber's yellow stream, and which by Nile shall rest, the leader's fate? This fight decides no more. Nor seek to know from me thy fortunes, for the fates in time shall give thee all thy due, and thy great sire, a surer prophet, in Sicilian fields shall speak thy future, doubting even he what regions of the world thou shouldst avoid, and what should seek? O oh, miserable race, Europe and Asia and Libya's plains, which saw your conquests, now shall hold alike your burial place. Nor has the earth for you a happier land than this. His task performed, he stands in mournful guise with silent look, asking for death again, yet could not die till mystic herb and magic chant prevailed. For nature's law, once used, had power no more to slay the corpse and set the spirit free. With plenteous wood she builds the funeral pyre to which the dead man comes. Then, as the flames seized on his form outstretched, the youth and witch together sought the camp. And as the dawn now streaked the heavens by the hag's command, the day was stayed till Sextus reached his tent, and mist and darkness veiled his safe return. End of Book Six